All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we would like to welcome each and every one of you to today's webinar prepared to you by the Environmental Landscapes Studio Laboratory uh, from, the, from the Landscape Architecture Department of the uh, College of Architecture of the University of the Philippines, Philippines. Uh, right. So, uh, we, uh, this is the second of the uh, webinar series prepared to you by the uh, Environmental Landscapes Laboratory. Um, and it is actually currently and mainly organized by the second year cluster of professors of the Landscape Architecture Program. Uh, so today for our speaker, have uh, with us, We have with us uh, uh, with us here in the Zoom room. Uh, we have the landscape architecture faculty. So hello uh, to my to my uh, faculty members here uh, in the Zoom. We will. Uh, we are also in uh, saying hello to our student participants who are also here with us in Zoom. Currently, we are streaming live in YouTube. Uh, through the Environmental Landscape Studio Laboratory uh, uh, YouTube page. So all you need to do is search for the Environmental Landscape Studio Laboratory uh, YouTube page. So for everyone who, are, who, are, who is watching us through that platform, good morning to you all. Of, to you all. Um, so today we have with us uh, a very... Uh, knowledgeable uh, landscape architect who will be discussing a very interesting topic about landscape ecology. He graduated 2015 uh, in Bachelor of Landscape Architecture from UP Diliman. Recently, he actually graduated and got his uh, graduate's degree in MS Environmental Science from UP Los Baños. He used to work in PGAA Creative Design and is currently doing uh, freelance work. Uh, so today we have with us aptly titled uh, to discuss this webinar topic aptly titled a primer in landscape ecology. With ha we have with us uh, landscape architect Balbino Santos. Um, so uh, we shall be playing his uh, recorded video for you. Um, but after our uh, the presentation, we will go back here uh, in Zoom to uh, because landscape architect uh, Balbino Santos will be with us to answer some of your questions right after the presentation. Um, I would just like to remind uh, everyone to uh, mute their uh, for those who are with us here in Zoom. So make sure that you your 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 audio is turned off until the presentation is over. All right. Uh, I will see you in a bit and good morning again to all of you. Ah. <sighs> 
Hello, hello, hello. I am Balbi Santos and I'm a landscape architect who focuses on ecological landscape design. First of all, I'd like to thank Sir Nappi for inviting me to this online webinar and uh, despite these uh, weird times, I hope all of you are comfortable in your homes and still manage to learn from online classes like this. All right, let's get started. So first of all, this uh, presentation I call a primer on landscape ecology. Why a primer? Because it's really foolish to think that we can fin cover the whole uh, breadth of landscape ecology in one hour or less. That being said, I hope that after this presentation, somehow, somehow, you guys get to understand landscape ecology and ecological concepts better. Even if you feel intimidated right now, even if you feel like, how the heck will I memorize all these concepts? Don't worry, I'll show you later that it's less about memorization and more about relating concepts and stuff to each other, which is the whole gist of ecology, relationships. So for this presentation, we'll have four parts. First, introduction to ecology, followed by a quick, very quick crash course-like section about species, population, and community ecology. Next, we'll have ecosystem structure, process, and function. And lastly, we'll discuss a bit on landscape ecology itself. All right, first of all, what is ecology? Uh, ecology comes from oikos, Greek word for home. And if you think about it, the earth is our home. Ecosystems are our home. Our lives are reliant on the process of ecosystems. So in a way, ecosystems are our home, our life support. And the study of ecology deals with the study of relationships. Relationships between organism to organism or the organism to the environment. And you'll see later on that everything is interconnected. Right, uh, before we can understand what an ecosystem is, first we have to understand what a system is. So basically, system is anything with any series of interconnected components. So these components can be in the form of plants and animals, or it could be in the terms of screws and bolts and things. A system doesn't have to be tangible per se, but it has to have components that interact with each other. Usually in a system, there's stuff that comes in that's, and stuff that comes out. That stuff can be uh, materials like uh, wood, like food, or it could be energy, like heat, or it could be information, like ideas. So if you look at this, you'll see that this whole thing is the system actually. The bowl is like a component, and that component takes in stuff, that's the inflow, and it releases stuff, the outflow. And each component, each output of a component can be an input for another. And sometimes it can loop back to the same component. In other words, a system is this series of interconnected components that input and output and relate into one another. The thing about this is that, about systems, is that you, can, you have to judge a system as a whole. You cannot judge it based on its parts. A uh, bike cannot work as a bike without its components, its handlebars, its wheels, its gears, all those separated cannot work and you cannot judge, you cannot appreciate a whole bike just by looking at its individual parts alone. Rather, you appreciate a bike as this series of interconnected parts relating to each other. And that is called emergent properties. In other words, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. So what are these examples of these emergent properties? Where's productivity? How much stuff do you produce? Like how much crops is harvested? Or stability, how well a system can take in disturbances, can handle disturbances? Or efficiency, how well it uses, a system uses resources and how little waste it produces? Another emergent property, which all of you might be surprised to know, is sustainability. Yes, sustainability is an emergent property. If you've ever heard of people saying plant trees because they're sustainable, well, first of all, they're wrong because trees are not sustainable. Blasphemy? No, 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 it's not blasphemy. Trees are not sustainable because they're not the system we're looking at. Sustainability is a system of the whole landscape or this landscape design. So we don't look at the trees and say that's sustainable. We look at the tree and how it provides shade to the concrete ground so that it doesn't heat up, how it absorbs excess rainwater so that it doesn't flood, how it provides habitat for birds and wildlife. That's what makes 
it's sustainable. Not the tree itself, but how the tree relates to other components of the system. So all I'm trying to say is, don't miss the forest for the trees. If you are too focused on one singular detail, you'll fail to see how that single tree relates to other trees, how it relates to other parts of the forest, and suddenly you don't see the whole forest, you'll get lost in the woods. Rather than looking at one individual tree, look at the big picture, look at the whole forest. Now, this brings us to why we should study ecology. Well, first of all, understand that there can be no economy without society, and there cannot be any society without the environment. In other words, the human and the natural realm are intertwined. You cannot separate them. They're two sides of the same coin. And as a result, whenever we study the human world or the natural world, we have to also study the other one. We, if you want to study cities, you have to study, we have to consider how they are affected or affect related ecosystems like agricultural fields or mountain forests. That's why we as landscape architects who are at the nexus of nature and society, we need to really inculcate the concepts of ecology and landscape ecology into our minds. When studying ecology, there are many levels and we can think of them as like nested matryoshka dolls. Like, you know, those toys where one wooden doll thing is in another? Yeah, nature is kind of like that. Think about it. All a group of cells is called tissues. A group of tissues is called an organ. A, gro a group of organs is called an organismic system. Or, yeah, organ system. And a group of those organ systems, the lung, the respiratory and the circulatory and the excretory system, that is an organism. A group of these organisms, of the same, same organisms, is called the population. And a group of populations is called a community. But where does ecosystem come in? It comes in when we introduce matter and energy. So if you look here, a community is a group of, like say, lions and antelopes and grasses and all that. But once you include sunlight, the soil, air, temperature, all those matter and energy, that's when you get an ecosystem. Now, a group of ecosystems is called a landscape. But more importantly, this, these ecosystems have to be heterogeneous, otherwise they're the same ecosystem. In order to understand landscapes, we have to understand ecosystems, how they work, how they function, how they are affected by other ecosystems, how an agricultural field is affected by a river or by a remnant forest ecosystem. That's why we start our, like, our discussion from the very basics. And by basics, I mean it's very basic, as in species which are the largest groups of organisms that can reproduce or that is to create viable offspring. You can see here that both of these are Maya birds or sparrows in English. Uh, one is, the one on the left is Pastor Montanus, that's the one we find here in the Philippines. But this sparrow, Russell sparrow, is one that's found in the mainland. This Eurasian tree sparrow is actually introduced in the Philippines. So its natural habit is also in the Europe and Asian mainland. So these two, how, how, why are there two species even though they look the same? Well, this guy at the right lives higher up in the mountains, whereas this guy lives closer in the coast, in the lowlands. And as you can see, uh, when species, when two populations are separated, they, one can adapt to its new environment. So what I mean by adaptation is natural selection. That is, a population of species uh, has to adapt to its environment, uh, whether it's extremely cold environment, extremely hot, extremely dry, extremely wet, or environment that fluctuates between these extremes. Not to mention competition from other species that need the same stuff as them. Basically, species are subjected to natural selection in a way that they have to be fit. Fit not as in exercise, but fit as in being able to adapt to change. So any organism that cannot adapt to change becomes extinct. This is what we call survival of the fittest. The species that cannot adapt to uh, changes in their environment, whether it's we're talking about changes in temperature or changes in resource availability in whether they can get food or not. That's what determines how a species becomes a species because if they cannot change how they are, then they cannot adapt to their new environment.
If you look here, this is, these are called Darwin's finches in, from Galapagos Islands. This guy named Charles Darwin, from whom the concept of natural selection originated, he determined that several species of finches have different beaks, if you notice, and each beak is specialized to eat different types of uh, food. For example, this bird here eats flying insects, this bird eats crawling insects, this bird eats nuts and fruits. Well, this bird, which is sort of like where these birds evolved from, they are more generalist. That means they eat all these nuts and flying and grounded insects. But because of environmental pressures, maybe because there were too many of these birds, number one, they had to move somewhere else. And in that new place, there's more of berries or more of ants. And it's better if they adapted their beaks to feed on this. Now, I keep on saying adapted their beaks, but it's not really a conscious process. It's more of a, if my offspring happens to have a longer beak than the others, he'll survive better. And if my offspring had a shorter beak, then he will be able to survive because he will be able to get the appropriate type of food using that unsuitable beak. Evolution occurs at the population level. You can see here that there are two sets of moths. One is super black, one is super white. What happened here is because of industrial revolution, the barks of the trees that they tend to stay in, well, they became dark because of all the soot. And what happens is varieties of these types of moths are of the same species. They're the same species, but uh, like how many of us have dimples, some of us have are taller or shorter, have dark skin, light skin, the same thing goes with moths. Some have a bit lighter pigmentation, some have a bit darker. Because of the environmental pressure that is darker barks, those who are darker skin will live and be able to pass their genes, their dark skin genes, to their ostrichs. While those that are light, it's easier for predators to spot them and eat them. So if they're, they're eaten, they're dead and they can't reproduce. So over time, the composition of their population changes from having maybe equal light and dark skin to darker plumage because that's what's more adapted. Now, as I mentioned, evolution occurs at the population, not at the individual. This isn't Pokemon. Populations are the ones that evolve. And because of that, it's important to understand how the dynamics of populations work. So uh, if there's one thing you just have to know about populations, it's this. Don't be daunted by the equations because this basically is saying for any population, a population increases if there's more births and if there's more immigration, that is new individuals of the same species coming from another population to this population. And the opposite of that is on is deaths and emigration, which reduces the amount in this uh, population. And notice that for many animals, many organisms, plants, fungi, bacteria, there's a series of local populations, but overall, they're called the meta population. You'll see later in landscape ecology that we deal with meta populations or how one local population is, interacts with another, like how different genes from population D go to population B and vice versa, or how disease transfers from each other. Now, the thing with populations is that although the population can persist for a long, long time, the individuals do not. But it doesn't matter for those individuals because what's important is their species, their genes go on and on, uh, persist for as long as possible. So there are strategies to help with this goal of keeping their population, their genes alive. There are three types of survivorship curves. First, type one is the slow and steady growers, those who care for their young rather than spray and pray, which is the type three, like frogs that reproduce by laying lots of eggs and most of them will die. Yes, sad truth of nature, but most of those eggs will die, but at least some of them will survive and those will pass on their, uh, let's say, stronger genes because they survive. So spray and pray is the name of the game for type three, whereas caring for their offspring until they become mature and be able to reproduce themselves. That's the type one. I have to also mention that with type one survivorship curves, most of them die at later ages rather than during childhood like in type three. Type two is just a uh, middle of these two. Now, populations grow exponentially. If every couple produces two children and those two children produce two children each, and if you graph the grow population growth, it'll show this exponential growth. However, resources are finite. Food is finite. If there's too much of a species, what happens is the habitat that supports them cannot support them anymore. And what happens is logistic growth. And this is what happens with most populations. They experience 
uh, exponential growth, rapid exponential growth at first, but eventually they tap off to the carrying capacity of the habitat, meaning there's an equilibrium between the number of organisms versus the amount of resources that's available. Now, uh, this related to the survivorship curves. Uh, for animals, we can categorize them into two types of life strategies. One is are selected species and the other is K-selected species. So K-selected species tend to be those type 3, slow and steady growth, care for their young, most of them die later in age. Whereas the spray and prey types, live fast, die fast, those are the R-selected species. And usually the shape of their body, the size, the how they do stuff, everything from reproducing to eating to how big they grow, it all relates to this strategy of grow fast, reproduce fast, and then die. Whereas case like the species value being stable and they thrive better by living long and investing. Now this R and K cate selection category does really apply for plants if you think about it because trees they also spray and pray like our selected species but they grow slow and steady. So what gives? The, well, this ecologist named Grime he determined that plants follow a different set of life strategies. Either and it all depends on stress and disturbance. Stress is how hot or how cold or how dry or how wet. Disturbance is how much does the system fluctuate between those extremes. High stress, low disturbance, think of deserts and salt marshes. Those are stress tolerant species. So we can think of succulents. Uh, Rudol species are those that are used with low stress and high disturbances, for example, grasslands. If you've been to Bataan, you'll notice there's not much trees because there's no point in investing biomass there because of all the typhoons that keep on ravaging that island all year round. So most of the plants there are low-lying and are used to disturbances. Those are Rudol species. But if there's low stress and low disturbances in the more tame environment, then that, those will become competitive. Plants. And the name of the game here is no longer whether they can adapt to stress or to disturbance, but how well they can outdo the other species, their competitors, in terms of resources. Populations are distributed in different ways depending on their environment. So some, like these fish over here, are clumped because staying together, they're stronger. These desert plants exhibit a uniform distribution. If you've heard of tree shyness, this is kind of the same thing, but with roots. Rather than try to compete with each other to outdo the other with space and resources in the same spot, they just keep their social distance. And because of that, they can have their own little world and not really be affected by the other. But most of the time, uh, distribution is kind of random. And there are other factors that determine how they are distributed. Populations also vary in terms of density. That is how much individuals there are per unit area. Some, like the Philippine Eagle, are very territorial. Thus, their population density is very low. Whereas others, like ants, are eusocial. That means they really like interacting with each other. They, they have to rely on each other. So those are high density populations. A group of populations is called a, is called a community. There are instances where one type of species is the most prevalent in a community. And that's what we call a dominant species. So for example, abandoned grasslands in the Philippines will see lots of kogon, imperata cylindrica. Those tend to be the dominant species. Often these dominant species are able to outperform other species in the area in terms of gathering resources. We keep on talking about our organisms competing with each other, which brings us to competition. After all, uh, resources are finite, they are not infinite, and there's only so much you can go around with. What happens is organisms have to compete with each other, with their own species, that's intraspecific, or with other species. They have to compete with each other for resources like food, water, space, sunlight if you're a plant or algae, territory if you're an animal like the Philippine eagle. All these are finite resources which they have to fight over. If two species have overlapping habitats or territories, they cannot coexist if they have the same requirements. So one has to give to the other. A lot of species are generalists meaning they can feed on a variety of foods or they can live in a variety of environments. However, they are often beat by those who specialize. Those are the specialist species and because of that, they have to give way to these specialist species and their fundamental niche is smaller than their realized niche. So ecological niche is the those factors that influence growth, survival, how they reproduce, 
if you can see here, this barnacle, this brown barnacle, it can survive in the entire intertidal zone. But when a more specialist barnacle comes in, which is better at gathering resources at this lower part, better at surviving at this lower part, then this first species, Thalamus, has to give way. And so its fundamental niche here at the left is the entire intertidal zone, but its realized niche is this small uh, area in the upper part of the zone. What if two species have the same, very same exact requirements? Well, they cannot coexist. This is called the competitive exclusion principle. And this means no two organisms having the same niche can coexist. You can think of it like a fiesta where people, if pe all people just like the lechon, then there won't be any lechon around. However, if if one, if on a few people, if uh, a lot of people like lechon, but also a lot of people like the uh, what's on our food, giniling, the tinole, the adobo, uh, all these varieties of food, suddenly there's enough food for everyone, and that's how uh, or, or uh, different species and organisms can coexist in a community. So if you check here, all these plants, the gabi, the kogon, the talai, they all need light, they all need soil, space. But was the agabi able to exist even if the kogon is more competitive? Simple, because in this area, it's more waterlogged, the soil is moist, more moist, and that's where the gabi specializes in. Hence, the gabi is able to establish a popul its population here. Hence, they and because damp soil, it doesn't need to compete for the other regular soil that the kogon is dominating. So they can coexist. And this is called resource partitioning, which means different organisms can coexist if they share resources. If they, uh, again, just harken back to the example with the fiesta and the food. Now, communities, different species, of course, they interact with each other. But how do they interact? Well, could be that one species benefit the other while the other is not harmed, uh, lang, that would be called commensalism. Like this water buffalo, who doesn't really mind the bird, but the bird is able to get all the insects that are on the bison's fur. The bison doesn't really mind if there are ticks, but hey, it's there, so might as well. Mutualism is where two species benefit from each other. Clownfish gain protection from the stinging tentacles of anemones, and in return, the excess food, the crumbs that the clownfish drops, gets uh, the anemone can feed on it. Of course, it can also be a totally one-sided relationship, parasitism, where one species benefits where the other is actively harmed. Now, in a community, there can be a keystone species. Now, these are species that they're not dominant. Their dominant species are based on the amount of stuff, the amount of biomass. But keystone species, even though there's less of them, they have a huge impact on the environment, often because they're the ones that shape the ecosystem. So, for example, here, the otter uh, keeps sea urchin populations at bay, and which allows kelp to grow. If you take away the otters, the sea urchin population explodes, and thus the, gray, the kelp are overgrazed or eaten too much, and the whole, the whole kelp ecosystem collapses. Therefore, this otter here is a keystone species. Now let's talk about ecosystems. Ecosystems are a group of communities that are interacting with the abiotic environment as well. Remember, ecosystems are biotic and abiotic. Those two must be present so that we can call something an ecosystem. You can, we can think of ecosystems as like computers. Computers, they have hardware, they have software. And we use computers for a variety of functions like printing an essay for Sir Nappi's lecture or we're surfing the web, playing video games. Whatever function is, if there is something wrong with the hardware, let's say there are missing keys in your keyboard or your mouse is malfunctioning or your screen is full of dead pixels, it can't really function as well. And if there's something wrong with the software, like say there's a virus in your computer, or if you don't have enough RAM and can't run the programs, then the computer also can't provide its function. In the same way, ecosystems cannot provide their function if there's something wrong with their structure, that is their hardware, or their process, that is their software. Now, what are these ecosystem structures, processes, and functions? We'll discuss next. So first, you might be familiar with the food chain and the food web. This has been taught in basic grade school, but there's more to this than what eats what. This is called the trophic structure, meaning what the meaning energy. We're talking about energy here. So if you check this out, you can see that energy from the sun is passed on to the producers. In this case, these are 
phytoplankton, which are eaten by the primary consumers, which are often, which are always herbivores or can be omnivores, which are eaten by secondary consumers, which are predators, which are eaten by other consumers, and ad infinitum until you reach the top of the food chain. Remember that with each time we skip into the next trophic level, there's less energy. So energy from the sun is converted by plants, but the plant uses a bit of that energy. So when insects eat that plant, they don't get 100% of the energy taken by the plants. And you'll see this pattern as you go up the trophic levels. What I'm saying here is that less energy for reproducing, less energy for grazing, for going around. So often, you'll see that at the top of the food chain, there's like this, like eagles, there's less of them compared to insects where there's literally more than of them than the entire human population on Earth. If we hearken back to the example of the otter and the sea urchins, we observe that the sea otter at the top of the food chain is keeping the sea, the populations of kelp high. They're keeping it high by keeping the populations of sea urchins at low. So the enemy of an enemy is a friend. That's what's called the trophic cascade, where the upper trophic levels are able to influence the population or the dynamics of lower levels. Autotrophs are the primary producers. They're, the, they're usually at the base of any ecosystem. So these producers can be plants, they can be algae. Heterotrophs are any of those that consume other organisms, not directly from the sun. So those include herbivores, carnivores, and even decomposers. Trophic levels are not the only way we can look at ecosystem structure. We can also look at the actual physical demarcations of ecosystems. So for rainforests, for example, uh, scientists were able to determine four layers, which are emergent layer, canopy, understory, and undergrowth. And the same thing can be said for marine zones. Uh, believe it or not, it's not just water and fish in the sea. There are lots of stuff here in between the photic zone, in the benthic zone, and even the abyssal zone. Now, in ecosystems, an important property is biodiversity, which is variability among all living organisms. Now, I said species diversity because often that's what conservationists look at when determining whether an ecosystem is diverse or not. But we can also look at genetic diversity or the variability in traits. And it, it's important to know genetic diversity because if you have, you have only the same type of genes across all populations, what if one type of disturbance comes in or let's say one type of pest comes in and decimates those with that gene? Since everyone has a gene, all the entire population is decimated. But if there are individuals with different types of genes that can resist that disturbance or pest, then the whole population lives on and the species does not go extinct. Another important type of diversity is ecosystem diversity, which is the variability between habitats. Because if you only have only forests on the, on the oceans, then there won't be as much species diversity. And often it's at the intersections, at the edges, at the transition between these two ecosystems that there's lots of diversity. Now let's head on to the processes of the ecosystems, the software of the ecosystem. So one process is primary production, which is, think of it like photosynthesis at the ecosystem level. And this primary production is measured in terms of biomass or the amount of biological material in a ecosystem, whether plants or animals or other organisms. Now the, oppos the opposite of primary production is respiration. Well, not opposite per se, but rather the pr pr primary production and respiration are interlinked in that respiration is like the amount of energy that exits the ecosystem, whereas primary production is the amount of energy that comes in. Energy in the form of sunlight, which could, could gets converted to biomass of plants, which when eaten by uh, organisms becomes uh, energy for those organisms. And respiration is all the energy released by plants and animals as heat whenever they do anything. Another process is the nutrient cycling or the shifting of stuff throughout the ecosystem. In this case, stuff is nutrients such as carbon. So we have the carbon cycle, nitrogen, or how, how nitrogen goes through these different uh, bacteria and into the plant roots and into uh, herbivores. Phosphorus, and of course, the hydrologic cycle, the water cycle, 
another ecosystem process is decomposition. Still the idea of nutrient cycling. If you think about it, decomposition is simply the biomass of an organism returning to the soil where it can be taken in again by the plants. And what happens is the energy, materials, the biomass cycles throughout the whole ecosystem. Hence, the, even though decomposition is not exactly a sexy concept, it's a very important process, not just in forests, but also in oceans, in aquatic environments. Now, all these processes are fine and dandy, but a lot of times, if they don't have the necessary prerequisites, then they won't be able to, to move as much. So these are called limiting factors. Think of like when you're baking a uh, cake. I don't know what components you need for a cake, but surely there's a bit of flour, eggs, icing, sugar, milk, all that. Now, the cookbook will specify 100 grams of sugar or one kilo of flour. If you have less than those required materials, then you cannot make a cake. Likewise, if you have less, not enough temperature, not enough moisture, or not enough nutrients, then these processes can't exactly work. Or, and as a result, the ecosystem can't function as well or at all. Another process which takes place in ecosystems is succession. Now, if you've heard of this, you'll know that often they simplify the term succession as the gradual change in plant and animal communities. So it's like lichen and moss give way to animal to herbs, which give way to perennials, giving way to scrubs, and then finally giving way to long living trees and old growth forests. But remember that we're talking in terms of energy here. So I made the mind map. I won't go through this because it's really, uh, it'll take a time, some time. But just remember that ecological succession starts at the pioneer stage and ends at the climax stage. The pioneer stage can be characterized like with grasses or moss, like an uh, in ecosystem that's just starting out. And an ecosystem that is in the pioneer stage will always prioritize growth. Whereas a, uh, an ecosystem, the climax stage, think of old growth trees, think of old ecosystems, basically the final form of an ecosystem, that's a climax stage. In a climax stage, they prioritize maintenance. So rather than accumulating more and more stuff, energy, materials, they retain what's there. So in, at this point, we can say that ecosystems in climax stages are in a steady balance. Of course, it will always come back to pioneer stage because of disturbance. But this, that, this, this is the beauty of ecosystems, is that they can recover into climax stages again. So what happens is instead of a static balance, we have a pulsating steady balance that's called a dynamic equilibrium. Now, how does an ecosystem progress from pioneer stage to climax stage? Well, there are three models explaining this. First is the facilitation model or pave the way. So it's like each new species creates an environment that allows another species to come in and repopulate. On the other end of the spectrum, it's more like all these species are there at present, but because of competition, they actively try to keep the other from proliferating. That's called the inhibition model. Now, a third model is tolerance model, which is they don't really interact much. It's less about organism versus organism, population versus population. Less of that and more of population versus environment. So whoever is able to adapt to the environment the most will survive. Whoever, whichever species survives, whether it's in through facilitation model or inhibition, which uh, in all these three, the name of the game is which species will come in. What will the ecosystem look like? Different ecosystems undergo different types of succession. So lots of terrestrial forests undergo lithosphere, have lithosphere communities. Serial communities are those stages between climax and pioneer stages. Keep that in mind. So those in between can vary depending on the ecosystem we're looking at. It can be lithosphere that begins from bare, lock, bare rocks, or it could be hydrosphere. We're talking about ponds here. So as you can see, eventually this pond will receive lots of sediments. It'll become shallower until it becomes a wetland. And then eventually it becomes a forest. So that's the fate of lots of uh, aquatic environments. And there's the Samosir, which is unique because you can see each cereal stage at the same time. So at the start, you can see that these plants are prostrate in the ground. You can see that they, they can't really take in the impacts of salt sprays, strong winds, tides rising and falling. But as the ecosystem develops, you'll see that 
here at the farther the farther they are, the more it develops. But because he, because of disturb of high disturbance here, it never really develops past the the low lying plants. So keep this in mind when you're designing coastal communities, designing resorts, and all that. Now we've talked about ecosystem processes and ecosystem structure. We can talk about ecosystem functions, or in other words, ecosystem services. So there are four types of ecosystem services. So provisioning ser services include food, shelter, firewood. So anything that can be tangible, that can be distributed as an object in the market. Regulating services of an ecosystem include protection from storm surges, slope stabilization, and keeping the temperature in a suitable level. Those are all regulating services. Then there's cultural services, which are ecosystem services that have something to do with uh, human society, human culture, rather. So, for example, tourism, the aesthetic qualities of a landscape, those are considered cultural values. Now, we have a fourth type of ecosystem service called supporting service. It's less about giving something to humans, to society, and more of allowing these three ecosystem services to exist, to be delivered in the first place. So, for example, pollination. Without pollination, we cannot grow crops. And without, if we cannot grow crops, we cannot have provisioning services. Nutrient cycling and and the other ecosystem process fall in the supporting services of an ecosystem. All ecosystems receive disturbance, but the more disturbance there is, the less likely an ecosystem is able to deliver its benefits, its ecosystem services, because it disrupts the structure and the process of an ecosystem. If an ecosystem is, is altered by disturbance so much that it becomes an entirely new type of system or ecosystem, then the delivery of a previous service can no longer be done. So disturbances can include fires, uh, tre falling trees, but they can also be human-induced disturbances like land use, change, and deforestation, urban sprawl. Ecosystems are resilient. How resilient they are depends on the ecosystem. So according to the intermediate disturbance hypothesis, all ecosystems need a moderate amount of disturbance because if there's too little amount of disturbance, then a few species will dominate. And when there are dominant species, other species cannot really get into the picture. So there's less diversity. But with too much disturbances, only those are selected species, those rural species that can survive disturbances, only they'll thrive in an ecosystem and thus the ecosystem will have less diversity. So we can think of this as like the Goldilocks zone. Um, just enough disturbances to, to keep the ecosystem fresh, kumbaga, but not too much that it'll totally decimate the ecosystem. Now, ecosystems, as I mentioned, are resilient, have, have different levels of resiliency, which is the capacity to recover their structure and their function after a disturbance. And ecosystems with lots of diversity are said to be more resilient because more species means more ecological niches being filled. A lot of them have overlapping niches. And what happens is, if one takes away, this remaining species can take over the function of that extinct species. Hence, resilience is a function of biodiversity. And having high biodiversity means having lots of ecological redundancy. Like I mentioned, having high biodiversity equals high resilience. All right, now we're at the last part of this lecture, landscape ecology. You might be wondering why we discussed all those tidbits. Well, that's because landscape ecology is a field of science that studies the interaction between spatial pattern and ecological process. Pattern and process. Pattern, the hardware. Processes, the software. As I've mentioned, ecosystems, a group of ecosystems is a landscape. We cannot analyze a landscape without knowing how ecosystems work. Now, take note that a landscape is not just we're not just talking about regions or large scales, although that's often a good application of landscape ecology, but even something as small as a small plot of lawn can be a landscape, provided that the area is spatially heterogeneous. So you can see here that in the far right, this is an ecosystem. This ridge uh, mountain thing is also an ecosystem. This, uh, I think it's a valley, is also an ecosystem. These rocky parts are an ecosystem. As you can see, they're heterogeneous, they're different types of ecosystems. 
those compressed landscape. And on the opposite uh, end of the spectrum, this may be just a lawn, but if you notice, this could be an ecosystem, this could be an ecosystem, this could be an ecosystem. As long as it's heterogeneous, we can consider him a landscape. Now, the what, what we usually look at landscape ecology is how pattern influences processes, how the hardware influences what software we can put in. Like how a low-end computer, we can't install high, high graphics software, high graphics games. In the same way, certain processes cannot exist when they do not have that pattern. But at the same time, processes can actually influence how a pattern is formed. This is a really interesting dynamic, which is why landscape ecology is its own field. The PCM model stands for patch, corridor, and matrix. And those three terms are what define the different types of patterns in the landscape, the hardware kumbaga. So first is the patch. A patch is any ecosystem or habitat that's just that differs from its surroundings in nature and appearances. So here you can see that this is a patch compared to the rest of the this landscape. So how do these patches look like? So they can be like you can think of them as like islands in an ocean. So in that case, an island is a patch where the ocean is the matrix. But you can also think of the top parts of mountains as like sky patches because organisms that exclusively thrive in the upper parts of the mountains, they can't really go to the next patch, which is the next mountain because it's too far away. So we can say that these are like islands. So that's a patch. Urban parks in a matrix of urbanization, that is also a patch. And coral reefs can be a patch where the matrix would be areas that are not coral reefs, that are just sand. Now, corridors are any feature in the landscape that is relatively narrow and like patches, they are differ from the surrounding matrix, the surrounding area on both sides, of course. You might think that our corridors think of a house corridor. So it's like um, some, some place that animals can pass through, which is true. Animals, organisms can pass through corridors, but remember that corridors are also habitats in themselves, like this river. This is a habitat for several fish and amphibians. When talking about landscape corridors, two terms arise that contradict each other, which are landscape connectivity and landscape fragmentation. Landscape connectivity is how interconnected are the patches and the corridors to, are to each other, whereas fragmentation is the opposite, how unconnected are they to each other. Whether a landscape is highly connected or highly fragmented spells the difference between extinction or being able to repopulate a population. Because if you check out here, for example, these wildlife corridors, because of human activity like building roads, their migration paths have been cut off. So what happens is they cannot perform their typical crabby lifestyles, these Christmas island crabs in Australia. So ecologists figured, hey, we should connect the fragmented landscape again. And they decided to create this ecological wildlife corridor, which allows these crabs to live their lives fully literally fully because they can't finish their life cycle without going back to the ocean. Corridors are thought of as habitats or connectors, but we can also think of them as filters or barriers. So for example, a corridor can limit the movement of a population of tigers, for example, uh, in a forest. It can, a river can bisect, cut in half a forest, which creates new habitats in either places. Like I mentioned, riparian corridors. Roads can also be considered as a corridor, albeit a corridor that prevents movement between organisms, but allows movement for another organism, namely humans, and any animals that tag along with the cars, like say, uh, invasive insects that get stuck in the radiator or windshield. Now, hedgerows are those remnant forests, forests that were left alone after the rest of the forest was taken down for agriculture, for example. And often, these hedgerows are important because they often serve as the only connector for otherwise fragmented habitat patches. Lastly, we have the matrix. Now, a matrix is anything, any type of ecosystem that is dominant in the site. A matrix doesn't have to be 
in the context of urbanization, although often it is. It can also be the context of forest. Like if a tree falls here, that's a new patch uh, where the matrix is the whole forest and the patch is the forest opening where species that grow fast die fast can. And the overall combination of these three type, these three patterns is called a mosaic. So matrix and patch and corridors are called a landscape mosaic. And often, this is what we look at when dealing with landscape ecology, the landscape mosaic. You can see here in this landscape, this is UP Diliman, and you can see that UP Diliman is really green, and it's a patch, an island in a sea of urbanization. So this is the patch, this is the matrix, and corridors include this road, this highway, this commonwealth. This can also be a, this is also a corridor, but also, these series of patches can become corridors for birds and other wildlife that can somehow cross this matrix. So how do these patterns come to be in the first place? Well, there are four causes for agents of pattern formation. Could be biotic processes, the abiotic environment, natural disturbances, and human activity. Biotic processes include vegetation and flora, what type of plants grows where, or what types of animals can have this territory, and we, how do these organisms interact with each other. Now, the abiotic environment includes climate and landform, because think about it, in a mountain that's facing the sea, the part that faces the sea will have more moisture and thus have more trees, while the other side will have less moisture, thus less vegetation. Natural disturbances like fires and tree falls, earthquakes, glacial movements also influence ecological succession because they really drastically change an ecosystem by totally decimating it. And depending on how well uh, the ecosystem can undergo succession, a landscape will change and morph over time. And lastly, we have human activities as an agent of pattern formation because obviously we humans just like to alter an environment. So through urban sprawl, deforestation, agricultural land use change, all these activities end up tearing down ecosystems, changing how ecosystems work, like damming, uh, installing a dam will suddenly uh, take away the river corridor and suddenly the ecosystem downstream, the landscape downstream will change drastically. To further expound on the causes of pattern formation, we can see here that this one mountain, which we'll otherwise see as just all green, it's not really the same all throughout because of differences in which way the landscape is facing on the mountain, the leeward, uh, windward side, how high they are, okay, or in what end, also what, uh, what uh, ecosystems are beside them. All those influence how uh, landscape, how what ecosystems form where, and how an, a landscape will develop. Even rivers, that the different depths of a river, the different uh, directions, and whether they are near at the headwaters or near at the deltas, at the near the oceans, all those influence which ecosystems a river has. In other words, we can't say that one river is the same all throughout. Like how one mountain is not the same all throughout. And that's the beauty of landscape ecology. We see what these uh, heterogeneous patterns are in an area, and we can analyze what how they relate to each other. And as landscape architects, we can see how we can integrate these patterns or how we can restore or alter these patterns to suit our needs. If you look at this cute little critter over here, this is a Mingan Shurat. And they're shaped like that, their mouths are shaped like that because they only eat earthworms. Earthworms that thrive in the mossy forests of Mount, of the peak of Mount Bingan. So in other words, this is endemic not just to the Philippines, not just to Luzon, but to Mount Mingan Peak. So as you can see, this, this sky island, this patch of mossy forest, is super isolated from the rest. And what happens is there's lots of speciation here that means lots of species lots of species that you can only found there, find there and what happens is if that disappears then the whole population of this of the cloud shurat for example disappears hence why it's important to really protect these critical habitats concepts like these are what we study in landscape ecology often uh, landscape ecologists are also conservationists who use landscape ecology to understand how 
patterns influence the survival of a population of species or a set of species. So two theories on populations are used in landscape ecology. First is the island biogeography theory. You, I keep on mentioning sky islands, and there's a reason for that. Why I use sky islands to refer to patches, uh, upper mountain patches, and that's because this started. It comes from this theory. Basically, we can think of each patch as like an island, and how close they are, or how far they are, how big they are, or how small they are, how convoluted their shape is, or how round or perfect their shape is, how defined their edge or not. Those, all those, influence how a species that thrives in that habitat can exist. Now, the second theory is the metapopulation model. In landscape ecology, we study metapopulations, not just populations, because when this, for example, this population becomes locally extinct, that is, all the species in this patch disappears, then this, the species from this uh, patch, other patch, can recolonize this newly evacuated patch, thus helping keeping the population maintained, the beta population steady. Even if these local populations exist, if they cannot get into each other, like say there's a highway going through their usual migration paths, then suddenly they can't rescue the population of each other in case they go locally extinct. And what happens is slowly each pop local population becomes extinct until the whole meta population disappears. Hence why it's important in landscape ecology. As I mentioned earlier, the populations in habitat patches will have different dynamics, different qualities depending on the properties of the patch. So as I mentioned, a larger patch will have more space for species, more space for populations to thrive in. But more importantly, concepts of core and edge. Because everything at the very edge of a patch is subjected to the dynamics of the matrix. So that means disturbances like say, a, let's say in terms of urbanization, noise will really interrupt the goings about of species here in the edge. As a result, those types of species that cannot handle disturbance stay here in the core, while those species that thrive in disturbance are at the edge. Those species that are at the core are often the endemic species and what and the unique ones. And what happens is if a habitat patch is smaller, then there will be less space for these species to thrive in, for these core species, for these unique species. And as a result, there will be less biodiversity. An example of a edge species is the pilandoc, which needs the forest, which needs forests, the deep forests for protection during the day. And in at dusk, they venture into the grasslands, the open areas, to forage for food. So their ideal habitat is a forest edge. Compared to that to the shrew rat I mentioned earlier, where they have special, they have really specialized needs, earthworms that can only live in the mossy forest undergrowth of Mount uh, of that mountain. The thing about habitat edges with lots of edges is that they exhibit uh, the properties of both the matrix and of the ecosystem, or the uh, the uh, dynamics of one ecosystem and another. What happens is those two dynamics mix and what happens is a unique ecosystem-ish. Yeah, it's actually a unique ecosystem in that edge, and that is called the edge effect. And the thing about edge effect is a lot more species can also exist in edge effect because it takes uh, species from the core and from the matrix as well as species that exist only in the edge, just like the pilandok. Another example of, inter of edges are intertidal zones or that area where that is covered by tides half of the time and the other time it's, it's not submerged. That's a, an, a habitat edge and it exhibits both the properties of the coast and of the marine zones. As a result, most of a lot of the biodiversity in a in a coastal landscape is found in the intertidal zone. Ikoto is more of a large, a large scale uh, edge. Like for example, here in the continent scale, this edge be, that serves as the transition between the Sahara Desert to the des, to the forests of Africa are called Sahel. Many unique organisms exist in this belt of habitat. But even though edges sound good, remember that 
the unique species tend to be those at the core. And the, if we if we have more edge area and less core area, then there will be less less uh, biodiversity overall. And as we've talked about, the less biodiversity, the less resilience, the less ability of an ecosystem to deliver its functions. So in other words, it's best to maintain a habitat patch rather than bifurcating it, like say, with a road. But at the same time, this can also be useful to prevent the spread of diseases between organisms that we're trying to protect, for example. It's not just patch size that influences the population and dynamics in a habitat patch. Patch shape also has a strong effect on these things that we like to monitor. We can see here at this convoluted shape on the right that there's more edge area than this simple circle. And with more edge area, obviously, there's more edge effect, which means more species. Patch shape and how it's oriented in the mainland, that also influences how a population is able to uh, get to for, how to migrate from the mainland to a island patch. When I remember when I say island, I mean patches in not actual islands, but can also be actual islands. Point is, if more of the island is facing towards the mainland, then it's more likely to be colonized because there's more and more chances for, let's say, a bird to be able to find this new habitat. Yeah, with this other one, it's easier to, for the bird or whatever animal or species to miss this spot, this uh, island. So it's less likely to be colonized. A population in an island that's closer to the mainland is less likely to go extinct than a population in an island that's way farther because it takes more energy to get into there. Whether we're talking about birds or crawling earthworms or, or skipping deer, whichever animal, the closer it is, the easier it is to access. Thus, it's easier for rescue effect to take in place. I've been mentioning uh, colonization, all this by organisms, by populations all this time. And what, I, what this means is that the local populations can... We're, we're, all, we're, just, we're just talking about metapopulation, basically, in all of this. And the rescue effect is the ability of that population to uh, save, quote-unquote, the population of another we're keeping it from becoming extinct, keeping the whole pato population extinct, or even just the local population from becoming extinct through the rescue effect. Right? And as you can see here, even if this island is quite far away, because uh, these islands are situated in a way that they're close to each other, and this island is close to the mainland, and thus easier to colonize, each island is easier to colonize, this becomes like a stepping stone patch. So we can think of islands that are arranged like this, but we can also think of uh, terrestrial patches like, say, urban parks. Imagine this is the uh, Sierra Madre Mountains, this is, and then this one is UP de Leman, this is QMC, this is all those parks. So th you can see that the more parks we have, the better the biodiversity of urban wildlife and the greater the ecosystem services that urban ecosystems can deliver. That ends our lecture. Uh, if you want to read more about ecology and landscape ecology, you can read Mollus, uh, this book. And this book by Turner, Landscape Ecology in Theory and Practice, is what I recommend for landscape ecology. Lastly, if you want to read more, learn more about how to integrate ecological concepts with landscape architecture, uh, you can check out my blog. Yes, this is a shameless blog, but I think that my blog and everything that I put in there can help you as landscape architecture students and even the professionals watching this to gain a better appreciation of nature, of ecosystems, and most importantly, of landscape architecture. And with that, I end my lecture. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Balbi. All right. <laughs> that was a, uh, a very exhaustive uh, discussion, primer. <laughs>
on landscape or landscape ecology. Crash so, course on landscape ecology. Yes. <laughs> All right. So uh, we have with us now uh, landscape architect Baldino Santos. So um, just in case you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, ask them for especially for our uh, Zoom participants who are with us today. Uh, you may um, use the chat box below for any of your questions. So just type it there. And then for those who are with us viewing it uh, via YouTube, uh, the Environmental Landscape Studio Laboratory YouTube page, you may also, uh, I think, publicly uh, post your questions as well. And hopefully we could read that, those, and then we could ask them to our uh, guest speaker for today all right so maybe we can just see the chat box if we have okay all right okay uh landscape architect uh balbi how are you how are you feeling hi i'm doing good uh kind of woke earlier than usual considering how my body clock is broken these days but i'm fine most uh, for the most part <laughs> right uh the, this this is really a, a challenging time for all of us so um we can is it okay to ask you questions now oh uh, yes yes i all right. welcome all questions all right so to start uh a student asked uh what brought about your interest in landscape ecology? Ah, yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I actually have a funny story about that. Um, during my time, uh, we didn't have any ecology classes, dedicated e ecology classes. Uh, it was the batch after me that had the first LA ecology class. So at first, I missed out on that. And... Of course, I, I think of Sir Dan who was teaching that time and I decided to sit in. And first time I heard about that, Kapatch Core the Matrix, I was enamored. But it didn't really stick with me until I actually took the board exams where I actually reviewed ecology for real. And that's when I realized how, how I've been studying every facet of landscape architecture uh, individually rather than seeing the big picture, seeing how each uh, of the lessons we take in undergrad how they interact with each other uh yeah ecology really taught me to look at the big picture to never miss the forest for the trees and because of this uh, desire to to really learn more on how to integrate uh, con uh these concepts these seemingly disjointed concepts which are actually uh interconnected i decided to have my to take on my further studies in environmental science yes yeah yeah uh, hopefully we would we could also inspire um some of our students here to to you know to, to take the same path as how you did it thank you landscape architect um next question um in what other ways might landscape ecology be relevant to managing forests ah uh, yes uh okay so here's the thing um Usually when we manage, when we look at landscape ecology, we look at it from a conservationist lens. So that means there's a specific uh, species that we're looking at, or not species, maybe a community group of population. The uh, point is we look, we try, we analyze this a site, a region, on how well it supports the functions of the, the how it supports the population, a community, how it keeps an ecosystem working. And in the context of managing forests, well, it's actually very related because we have any threats to our virgin forests, our, 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 all our forests, mangrove forests, uh, threats such as urbanization, uh, urban sprawl, uh, land use change, um, the slash and burn, turning all these forests into crops. And... Actually, if you check out maps, uh, if you're, you're, you're through landscape ecology, you can, what you can do is check out maps of the same area in different times, and you'll see how the map evolved, how the landscape evolves 
and from that you can predict how how that how land how urbanization and all these factors influence or change the pattern of a forest so uh, there are many studies with uh, forests and landscape, and landscape ecology. I won't go much too deep into them because each one is very intricate. So, but uh, all I can say is it's very, very, uh, it's very, very related uh, magic forests and landscape ecology. Right. Uh, were you able to uh, use your thesis? Uh, I mean, use landscape ecology in your thesis in your graduate? Uh, uh, more degree? of the ecology part, the material and energy flow. Yes. Because my thesis is about the carbon uh, balance, the carbon dynamics of a green roof. So I look mm -hmm. at the carbon storage, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and I treat it's like I treated the greenhouse as an ecosystem. Kumbaga. So... Um, uh, if I had more time and resources, then I think I would have done what I would have done is study the entire you know, city. But uh, yeah, I had I didn't have that much time, so I just focused on a smaller side that's more doable. Right. But if any of you are interested in doing that, uh, the uh, interconnectedness of urban parks, uh, they go for it. Uh, really, and I could maybe I could give some tips if you need some help. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, one, another comment. Uh, good morning, sir. Thank you for a very informative lecture. Um, and her question goes, given the population growth types and that the overall human population currently falls under an exponential growth model, uh, she's wondering what measures do you think should be taken in order to mitigate or manage human population growth. Uh, and there's also a following quest follow-up question. Do you think switching to a logistic growth model is still possible? Hmm. Okay, um, let me clear up one thing. The well, all populations start up as, as as exponential, but eventually they become logistic because of uh the carrying capacity, that is uh the ability of a place to support. Uh, a population. So in this case, the place is the human or uh, the earth, and the populations we're talking about are humans. And you, we can actually we can already see in more developed countries where their population boom uh, occurred uh, many years ago that their population already population is already capping off. In fact, uh, look at countries like Japan where their population is even declining. However, right now uh, in countries like uh, the Philippines, Brazil, uh, developing countries. Their population booms just started recently, and that's why it seems like it's we're still in an exponential growth trajectory. But eventually, we'll reach that uh, cap. Now, the question is: Would we do we want to reach that point? Because usually, when a population reaches carrying capacity, what happens is uh, mass hunger, uh, mass death, all that, and that's not that's a really grim thing to see. So, really, uh, the best to answer your question. In order not in order not to reach that uh, dire fate, we have to manage our resources more efficiently. Like, uh, like distribute uh, resources more, more, I don't know, more. What's that term? More equitable, more equitably. Yes. All right. Um, next question: How does landscape ecology affect urban design or the urban landscape? Ah, a lot. Okay, so uh, here's the thing. Um, we always think that the human realm, cities, and the natural realm, which are forests and all the other ecosystems, we think that we often think that they're separate, that there's a pristine environment and there's human uh, civilization. But the truth is they're really intertwined. You cannot separate them because, as I mentioned, there can be no society or economy without the environment. So think about it. Uh, ecosystem services ecosystem services such as regulating urban temperatures by interlacing uh, uh, habitat patches uh, of uh, vegetation trees in the urban fabric that, al that allows the city to gain the, uh, the regulating services of the ecosystem that is uh, prevent that is reducing uh, urban temperature that's reducing temperatures ambient temperatures. So what I'm saying is by, by integrating 
uh, the natural environment with the human environment, or rather by accepting that they are, they cannot, you cannot separate them, we begin to uh, acknowledge the important, the, that nature is the life support of cities. And we begin to see, uh, we begin to plan with that mindset. Kumbaga. Right. Thanks. Um, okay, we have a very timely question. Good day, sir. Ah. Thank you for your lecture. Can landscape ecology help in the prevention of disturbances such as pandemics? Ah, okay. Um, let's see. So there has been a lot of talk where on how the how the natural how the destruction of the natural environment exacerbates pandemics. And okay, so there's some theory behind that. Um, I mentioned this earlier. It's the uh, what you call this? Uh, it okay. Think about this. Every 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 individual, every organism, every species has its checks and balances. That means there is something that keeps it from be, from becoming too um, too dominant in a landscape. So, for example, um, uh, listen, listen, tayo na onte Mahogany trees, mahogany trees. Uh, so itay mahogany. They their natural realm is in the uh, South America, Caribbean area. And the thing about that is because in that ecosystem there, they have, they have, uh, they have a natural predator, which is a type of uh, insect borer. And what happens is those uh, trees, to make up for the fact that, they, that these uh, insects really decimate their population, they have to grow fast, really. They have to be aggressive. And and so nangyayari, nagbabalance, di ba? Yung pagka-voracious ng insect and the uh, growth, the aggressive growth of mahogany. But you put them in another ecosystem, another place like the Philippines, they have no competitors. They have no checks and balance. So they can grow free, willingly. That's why they become invasive. Same thing with um, vir- viruses, vira, viruses and pandemics. Because, because of... Uh, the destruction of natural environment, you mga, their checks and balances are removed. And what happens is these viruses can can suddenly uh, proliferate. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait. Uh, yes, that's all. All right. Sorry. Um, well, in relation to, to another relevant topic, um, okay. one... Uh, Actually, to to uh, resp- uh, participants asked. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you, sir. If uh, I'm not mistaken, you've mentioned the mangrove forest. Now, yes. how efficient is ma- is, is the mangrove uh, than the dolomite in Manila Bay? And mm-hmm. uh, one of our professors actually asked, "What are your thoughts on mm-hmm. the Manila Bay system?" Oh. Uh, okay. In 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 uh, Manila Bay system or not the sands landscape yes. ecological approach to rehabilitate <laughs> and develop it. Okay, okay. So um, here here is a concept that's always thrown around, but it's really relevant. Uh, ridge to reef. That means you, when analyzing a landscape or an ecological system, you do not just look at the site. Okay, you do not. Yeah, uh, again, do, don't miss the forest for the trees. So let me, in this case, don't miss the site for the entire landscape. So even if your site is just this, maybe the whole landscape is this. And what hap- uh, in terms of ridge to reef, maybe your site is, say, the Manila, Manila Bay, but it's affected by Laguna Bay. It's affected by the upper mountains, the Sher Madre, all the, the runoff from the Sher Madres, from the Sher Madre, uh, goes down, flows down into the bay. And mangroves are there to protect, to sort of buffer against that. To buffer to instead of having the silt go all the way into the sea, uh, thereby polluting, the mangroves search, serve as the shield, kumbaga, for that siltation. Now, uh, you know, removing uh, removing these uh, mangroves will will you'll remove the shield of the shield uh, shield against siltation against runoff, and what happens is, uh na po yung uh, Manila Bay and water bodies. All right. Okay. Next, um, before designing, how long does it take you to identify the existing ecosystems within the space? Ah, good question. 
Okay, so okay, uh, we are landscape arch- we're called landscape architects because we deal with landscapes, and as I've mentioned, landscapes are a heterogeneous group of ecosystems that interact with each other. So the first thing I do uh, when analyzing a site, ecologically speaking, is to check out which you know, which factors are relevant, which what stuff comes in, what stuff stays in the site, what stuff comes out of the site, and more importantly what happens in the site, what happens with the site with respect to adjacent sites, what happens to the entire region. So I make an inventory first. Uh, I list it down. And actually, I use, uh, I use uh, some d- diagrams, like Costa Duke diagrams, um, uh, material, material flow uh, diagrams, all that, to help me visualize what those, uh, those dynamics. And by, by doing that, I'm able to see which, which stuff loops around. So that's called the feedback loop. So, so for example, I see something that if this happens, if A happens, then B happens. But if B happens, C happens. And if C happens, A happens even more. Then I see that it's self-reinforcing. And I'll consider that in the design, whether I want right. to retain it or to emphasize it. Right. Thank you. Um, another question, since we're in the topic of developments, mm-hmm. uh, as uh, a participant is asking, what are your thoughts on the sky terrace in SM Baguio, where ah, they yes. uproot, uh, where they uprooted large number of pine trees? Ah, yes. Um, uh, in, to keep it short, uh, I don't like it at all. Because you're replacing something that's functioning into, with something that just looks like it, but doesn't really function the same way. Remember... Think of ecosystems like computers and like computers with different hardware and software de- delivering functions. It's by replacing the pine forest with the, this development. It's like you're replacing a uh, a high-end laptop. You're replacing it with a I don't know with a with a five thousand peso laptop that you buy from Divisoria. And sure, they're both laptops, but they don't function the same way. That's the thing. Now, having said that, remember that we should not be anti-development, okay? Uh, development is good, but you should always ask the question, development for whom? All right. All right. So uh, maybe for our last question, actually, our, our chat box is very um, active, currently active with lots of I questions. Noticed. But maybe we could ask just one last question, um, Lance, if okay. Santos, if it's okay. All right. Sure, this sure. is one uh, from our faculty members. Um why is it that in spite of the awareness level or consciousness regarding the need to protect and conserve our environment, the policies focused on responsive planning and decision making, the, the presence of capable and committed, leader, committed leaders, or etc., we remain mute witnesses to widespread degradation, destruction, and wasteful consumption and waste generation? Oh, that's a, that's a very... Uh... That's a very deep question. <laughs> okay, so why is it that despite uh, high awareness levels, why is it that despite there are policies focused on planning, that there are still mute witnesses yes. to this degradation? That, uh, uh, all I can say is uh, it's a complex problem, and we can, I cannot answer that in just one going. Because remember, um, different dynamics, it's different dynamics in the social system naman. So, in terms of policy and all that, uh, if uh, I'm not really uh, much of so too much of an expert in uh, policy making and economic and uh, economic side of environmental science, but uh, to answer your question, there are there are like large uh, there are huge uh, drivers, huge entities that drive these movements, these you know, how these things happen and really uh some really uh ano ba? uh we can it's really it's a really complex problem eh? and i'm sad to say i can't really answer this for uh in one sitting so yeah uh i'm sorry i can't answer that at the, at this moment all right it, it's a very uh 
personal question as well. So mm-hmm. we are very thankful, uh, landscape architect uh, Baldi Santos. We actually have a lot of uh, additional questions uh, here in the chat box. Uh, oh, yeah. Maybe we could send it to you, and hopefully, we you could address some of these questions, and then we can relate it. We can relay them to our um, student oh, yes, participants. Please. Thank yes, you for please. your time. All right. So uh, to close uh, today's webinar, uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Napi Navara, uh, as uh, one of our professors in the second year cluster uh, in the landscape architecture program uh, to, to close this webinar. Um, Dr. Navara, please. Thanks, Frank. Um, so, well, uh, I was listening to the question, um, well, particularly the, the last one. And uh, I feel that it's uh, n- not really that it's not fair, but um, I think it's a really complex. I agree, it's a really complex um, question to answer. In you know, and um, if we only know the answer to that one, we'd be able to answer all the questions that we have right now. Why are we in this state right now? And um, you know, why are we encountering these problems? And why are we still a developing country until now? Um, that could have, you know, that could have solved the uh, answer the questions, the, those questions that all of us have been asking also. Um, um, I think um, this, um, this type of webinar, doing this in a, this kind of platform, this is our attempt to, uh, to answer, to, you know, to offer solution to this one. Um, maybe we have high awareness of those, of these things, of the effects uh, um, of every decisions that we do, but the point is um, sometimes we don't really converse a lot of this, and or we don't offer. Um, um, we are stuck on the theoretical level of these discussions, the underpinnings of this one that um, we don't get to translate this into actions or even long-term um, policies that we sorely need, and. Um, you know, yesterday was the um, um, uh, was a um, not really a commemoration, but it's a reminder for us on on how we allowed um, some people to govern us into those you know those dark times of our history. Um, but um, we may wonder why did why did you know people then allow that to happen? Why did martial law happen? But it mainly happened because not a lot of people were talking about this or even not a lot of people had the, um, the courage to stand up to it. And uh, I think it's not because that we lack the knowledge about it, but it's mainly because we didn't do anything about it. And that's what we are doing here in this webinar series that we have to start talking about these things um, you know, um, the academe should take more active role um, in discussing these things that matter to us, to us, and um, and we have to involve everyone, not just you know, not just um, among the people in the academe, but people who could um, who could be part in this conversation. That's why we are putting this in YouTube, although all of us, well, many of us are not that comfortable talking about this, or some of the some of the speakers may have been forced, you know, to to go, to go into this kind of platform. But the point here is that um, we have to go out of our comfort zone and um, involve as many people as possible so that they could be part in coming up with a solution, not just whining about things or not about, you know, um, coming up with, you know, hypothetical questions of, uh, of this one. Um, so this is a start of, of these kinds of more conversations. So we'd like to thank um, Balbi Santos, um, our graduate. You know, um, he graduated what five years ago? It was five years or four years ago? And mm-hmm. already he has been, you know, um, 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 making a lot of you know these uh, coming up with these statements. And we hope our students would also be. Um, be able to to grasp this um, these principles and be able to apply this in their design not only for landscape ecology class but in their designs the, um, in even you know in something that is as um, 
as seemingly unconnected to landscape ecology, you know, even in their everyday lives, they at least become part of their system. So we'd like to thank um, Balbi Santos um, for being our um, resource person and uh, also to his, you know, also to his, um, to the faculty members who have molded him, you know, in his mm -hmm. undergrad in a BL, uh, yes. BLA um, undergrad course and to, to his master's um, uh, program in UPLB. Um, and also would like to thank also the, uh, the UPRT LA faculty for, um, for, for helping us organize this, for singing us through this. Although I know um, we are all trying to um, get a grasp of this new technology and for supporting each other. Um, and to everyone, okay, to uh, Frank, AJ, Mom Dalingan, um, Dan, Sir Nori, who else is here, Madonna, um, Sharon, and also, of course, our um, UPRK admin, our dean, our college secretary, and to the students. Um, I hope that you have picked up some learnings um, in this one, and, um, and uh, I hope that uh, you become more uh, involved in the conversation, in our discussions um, about uh, anything about landscape architecture, because um, um, being being here, okay, is a step toward you know coming up with a more unified and um, and as well as inclusive discussion about things. Again, thank you very much on behalf of the Environmental Landscape Studio Laboratory. We'd like to thank everyone for. Um, for joining and participating in this conversation. Thank you very much, Frank. Thank you, uh, Dr. Napi Navara. Uh, so to, again, just a, a reminder, we shall be seeing you guys again. Uh, this is just uh, the second of a webinar series that the Environmental Landscape Studio Laboratory has prepared for all of you. Uh, so on behalf of the Landscape Architecture faculty, of the College of Architecture of the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Uh, we like to uh, say thank you again to our speaker, uh, Landscape Architect Balbi. And we hope that for, for everyone who is watching us on, on YouTube, we would like to say thank you to all of you. And we will see you next uh, Tuesday for the next of the webinar series from the Environmental Landscape Studio Laboratory. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Okay, Sam, thank you.